Ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. All right, uh, listen, um, I am going to do one of those messages where we have to go back and review. We got to review a little bit because three weeks ago, right around that time, just about three weeks ago, I had the Lord uh, wake me up and give me a word. And I started preaching on that a couple of weeks ago, and the message was about your perception of yourself. What he did was he woke me up just to bring this review to you, and he spoke these words. He spoke the words that the angel spoke to the women that showed up at the tomb when Jesus had risen from the dead. And he said, go tell the disciples and Peter to meet Jesus into Galilee. Okay, so the angel of the Lord said, go tell the disciples and Peter. And that's what he downloaded to me. Again, when the Lord speaks to you, it may not be, it's never going to be like a human talking to you. Let me tell you why. Because a human talks to you, they can say three words and that's what you get. You get those three words. Someone says, I love you. You get, I love you. Jesus says, I love you. It's given to you in a thumb drive. <laughs> he puts it in there, and you open the file, I love you. And you're, you're unpacking that for months, sometimes years. Of, he spoke to me. What did he say? He said, I love you. But what did that mean? It just, it just kept growing. He's still revealing and revealing and revealing and revealing. And some of you know what I mean. You have these moments, that even, even in your testimony, where you may say, I had an encounter with God on this date. And when I encountered God, he said this. But what you didn't realize was there was more. He kept unpacking and unpacking and unpacking. And you're realizing he said a whole lot in one word. So when he said to me that verse, he said, I want you to go and read it. And I want to show you some things out of this verse. And so that's what we started teaching on two weeks ago. And what he, what he unpacked in the process was about our perception of ourself. How do you get to that? Because Peter had just denied Jesus three times. Peter had just denied him. And, and for some reason, because we've heard the gospel message so many times in America, we get, I mean, we get foggy. We just get, we're like, I've heard this, and I've heard this, and I've heard this, so I know what you're going to say. And so we can say this sentence and never even think twice. Peter denied Jesus three times. Yeah. But what, what, what does that mean? How much weight was on that? Peter went from being the one who always wanted to be with Jesus. And Jesus took him everywhere. When Jesus raised the dead, Peter, James, and John went in the room with him. When the Mount of Transfiguration... When he revealed himself and he lit up, Peter, James, and John were there. He took him into special situations, because, not because Peter was just special, but because Peter wanted to be with him. Peter was the one that got out of the boat and tried to walk on the water. He did it for a little bit and then sank, but he's the only one to get out of the boat. And he got out of the boat for one reason. He said, Jesus, if that's you, tell me to come to you. And Jesus said, come on. And the Lord spoke to me years ago. He said, Peter just wanted to be with me. He wasn't trying to walk on the water. He wasn't saying, hey, Jesus, if that's you, let me do that. He said, if that's you, tell me to come to you. He said, come. It was his desire to be with Jesus no matter what was going on that got him out of the boat. That person who had the absolute revelation of who Jesus really was. The one, when they walked into the region of Caesarea Philippi, which is uh, in, in Israel, you can go there. If you take a tour to Israel, they'll, they'll take you to the location. There's this mountain, and there's all these little holes that you'll see that are carved in the side of the mountain, and those holes that are there actually held gods. There were gods placed all in those little holes. And he took him to a place where there was all these gods. And he said, who do men say that I am? Well, some say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets or John the Baptist risen from the dead. He says, well, but who do you say that I am? And Peter stood and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. 
And what did Jesus say? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood did not, not reveal this to you. But he didn't stop there. Do y'all remember just a short few minutes ago when we were in this kind of a free flow of worship? And in that time of worship, there were some things that were being said. And one of the things that was said was, what is your name? One of the other things that was said is, what name has he given you? Interesting, because in the story, he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. But then he said, and you are Peter. He changed his name. He said, you are Petros, Rocky. And upon this Petra, this massive immovable rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He wasn't saying I'm going to build my church on Peter. He said, I'm going to build my church on what just happened to you. It was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. You had revelation knowledge come to you that no man can give you. It came directly into your, into your heart, into your spirit, and you know now I'm the Christ, the Son of the living God. That happened to Peter. You understand who we're talking about here that said, I don't know the man. I don't even know him. He told Jesus, look, you got to make this personal, guys. He's sitting around the table with the rest of the disciples. He, we're all sitting together, guys. We're all hanging out. And Jesus says to us, hey, one of you is going to betray me. And this is Peter. You know, he's sitting at the table with us. And he goes, if all of them betray, will betray you, I will never betray you. <laughs> That's what he did. They're all sitting... Hey, if all these guys deny you, I'm not denying you. I'm not betraying you. I'm not turning on you. And Jesus just said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. No way. Peter would have never, he just wouldn't believe it. There's no way I'm denying you. This, it's me. It's the guy who always wants to be with you. It's the one that you take into the secret place. It's the one you take to raise the dead. It's the one you take with you when you transformed yourself and you said, don't tell anybody until you're raised. Peter, it's the one who got the revelation. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're not Jesus, son of Joseph. You're Jesus, son of David. See, there are a lot of times if you read your scriptures, you'll find where someone, like the blind man, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You ever catch that? Son of David, he called him the Messiah. You're the promised one. The promised one that was to come. The fulfillment of the word of God that said, David, from your descendants, one will sit on the throne forever and ever. You're that one. The blind man could see that. <laughs> Son of David. But Peter denies him. I want to I read a few verses to you. I know we're going over and reviewing, but we need to because there's more to unpack here, and God's not finished with it, with us. So... I don't know how many times we're going to go through this, but we're going to go through it till we get everything unpacked that he has packed in here for us. After Peter denies Jesus, it says that Jesus looked at him. This third time he said it, I don't know the man. Jesus turned and looked, and he caught eyes. And that had to be like some of the most impactful shame that we could ever even begin to fathom. And it says that Peter ran out and wept bitterly. This is a man's man 
works on the docks, hauls in nets with his hands, that kind of a fisherman. And he's weeping bitterly, just like, I can't believe. It says that when he caught eyes with him, he remembered. He remembered what, what Jesus had said. You're going to deny me three times. I believe with all my heart that for the next three days, Peter went through one of the worst torments that any of us could ever imagine. I believe the enemy stood and preached to Peter every day. He preached the word of God to Peter, but not what you think. He preached stories like this. He preached any man after putting his hand to the plow and turning back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus told them that shortly before Peter betrayed him. He told him, any man having put his hand to the plow and turned back is not fit for the kingdom. Peter, you're no longer fit for the kingdom. I guarantee he said that over and over. I bet he woke up hearing that, hearing that, hearing that. You know what else he preached to him? And I say to you, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the angels of God in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before the angels of God in heaven. And the devil preached that to him night and day and said, Peter, God is talking to Jesus right now. And Jesus is saying, Peter, I never knew him. I don't know the man. You understand, Peter, right now, the angels of God in heaven are hearing, he don't know you because you denied him. He's using the Bible and he's preaching condemnation on him and heaping shame Layer after layer after layer after layer of shame. Peter, it's over. You were so close to him. You could ask anything. And now, he doesn't even know you. I don't know if any of you have ever been through a, a, a season of shame. Or you've disappointed yourself and God. But it's not a small thing. It can be absolutely overwhelming. Shame can be, shame can, can kill you. Because what shame will do, it, shame can't take your life. Shame works for you to take your own. See, the enemy couldn't kill Peter. But I guarantee you, Peter had lots of thoughts. That three days were not pleasant. Jesus has just risen from the grave, and he sends the angel of the Lord to send a message. I want Peter. I want redemption for Peter. Go tell the disciples and Peter. To meet me. That's amazing to me. <laughs> that restoration was what's on his mind. When he had every right, he had every right to judge Peter right there. He had, he had the word. He had every, every right to say, nope, you had a chance. But look what he did. I want to read these verses again. Out of John 21, verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, who did he talk to? Hello? No trick question. Who's he talking to? Simon Peter. But this is what he said. Simon, son of Jonah. Wow. Wait a minute. <laughs> he didn't call him Peter. Simon Son of Jonah? This is what it says here. 
son of John. New King James says, son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah, that means son of. He said, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? You know why he said more than these? (laughs) He's sitting around the same table with the same people. Though all of these betray you, though all of these turn against you, I won't. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And if you know the history of it, it's he used two different words. Do you agape me more than these? And Peter said, I phileo you. I love you like a friend. And then when he says that, he said, yes, Lord, I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? This time he said, Simon, do you phileo me? He came down to his level, and he said, yes, I phileo you. You know that I love you. He said, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. This is one of the things we talked about a few weeks ago, and that was the three opportunities for redemption for the three times that he betrayed him. The three times he said, I don't know you, he gave him time to go back. (laughs) Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? But he's talking to him as Simon Bar-Jonah. Why? He's going back to before he had the revelation of you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because now he's going to bring him right back around to being Peter again. And he said to him, he said, when you were younger, you went where you wanted to go. But the time is coming when they will gird you. And they'll take you where you don't want to go. Signifying to him the type of death that he would suffer to glorify God. That doesn't seem real encouraging. But it was. That even in his death, he was going to glorify God. I I mean, I don't know about you, but I I want that for me. I really do. If I die before he returns and I meet him before he comes and reveals himself to the whole planet at one time, I want my death to glorify him. I want everything about my life and death to glorify him. So even in my death, that's that's an honor. Isn't it? So he told him how he was going to die, and and Peter's still giving him his yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? Yes. Do you love me? And he is redeeming him back into position. He doesn't have to do this. He has every right to just cast him aside. Listen, Peter wasn't the only one that denied Jesus that night. There was this other disciple named Judas. He betrayed him that night. But what happened? One betrayed him and completely got consumed in the condemnation and took his own life. That was the ultimate goal the entire three days that the enemy was heaping on Peter, I He wanted the exact same result for Peter. Done with you, man. You might as well just die. There's no hope for you. So what did Jesus do? Immediately he worked on the redemption for Peter to see himself different again because it was important how Peter perceived himself. It was important to get him out of that pit. It was important enough to Jesus to focus on him and say, we're getting out of this pit right now, Peter. I know where you've been for three days, but I'm giving you redemption. And not only that, you're going to die in a glorious way to glorify God. You're going to give your life for the gospel. You're going to be honored in heaven as one who gave their life for the gospel. That's pretty serious redemption. Part 
part two. Even though I gave this message two weeks ago about this redemption and it being the most important thing on God's mind, and even though we talked about how the Word of God said things that were, he could rightfully judge Peter at this point and cast him aside. He's forsaken him. He's denied him. He's turned his back on the, on the kingdom. He's put himself to work and turned away. He's not fit. It's according to the Word of God. And yet, he gets restored. Let me say something. Part two. We need to understand this. The scripture says, the goodness of God leads us somewhere. Where is it? Repentance. Repentance. The goodness of God is not winking at Peter's sin. The goodness of God is not going, it's okay, Peter. I know I said that, but didn't really mean it. That's not, what is, that's not what's happening. I don't want to leave that lasting impression. Yes, yes, Peter did all these horrible things, and now he's restored. I don't want to do that without also talking about the seriousness of sin. Because God's not winking at it. God's not pretending he didn't do it. God's given him the amazing grace and mercy that none of us deserve and restoring him. But there are consequences to sin. There are consequences. The wages of sin is death. It doesn't mean God's just going to strike you down. God told Adam, Adam, look, you can eat of all the fruit of this garden, but there's this tree over here you can't eat of. The day you eat of it, you will certainly die. Didn't he? Gave him a choice. You can eat of all this. It's all for you, but don't eat of that one. So guess what? (laughs) They hated that one. And they died. But he said, the day you eat of it, you'll die. He didn't say it'll catch up to you later. Did did Adam die the day he ate of it? Some of you say no. Some of you say yes. The answer is, yes, he did. Because the one thing that mattered was the real Adam. And the real you is the spirit being, not the flesh being. The flesh finally caught up and laid down. But Adam got hooked into death and couldn't detach himself from it once he sinned. That brings a wage to it. And the wages of sin is death. And it was passed on to all mankind and even affected the earth itself from sin. Listen, there are a lot of things happening in the earth right now that are unusual. You notice? If you're a a political person that's bent one way, you'll find that that is called global warming or climate change. Now, whether you believe in that or don't believe in that, I'm not arguing whether it's it's climate change or global warming or any of that. Listen, I believe that there is climate change happening. I absolutely believe the climate is changing. But it's not changing because we're putting too many cars out. It's changing because of sin. Sin affects the earth. It doesn't have to be the judgment of God. You've sinned and I'm judging you. Look, God's not judging you. God wasn't judging Adam. What did God do? He went looking for Adam. He knew what Adam did. Adam, where are you? He says, well, I was naked so I hid myself. Who told you that? Have you eaten of that tree? But he searched him out. Adam covered himself with fig leaves. God said, not going to work. Fig leaves don't work. Not good. They kind of itch. You don't want that. It's not what he said, but you know. (laughs) Fig leaves not good enough, so he did something that had never, ever happened in the planet, ever, ever. He killed something. There had never been death before on the planet. Never had been death. And he killed an animal, most likely a lamb. And Adam had to watch the lifeblood come out of that thing. And then he took the skin off of it and put it on Adam. Why? The seriousness of sin required a sacrifice. And Adam got to see what the 
penalty of his sin did to that lamb. It didn't do anything. Adam's sin killed that lamb. Our sin killed Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. We killed Jesus. Hello? Just so you know that. He wasn't killed by Romans or Jews. He was killed by us. Our sin put him on the cross. And he went willingly as the innocent substitutionary sacrifice. And that's the importance of Passover. Not Ishtar. Don't get me started. I might have already started, but... I always said, you know what? I, I, ne- I never really thought I was going to pastor. I just thought I was going to stay in the prophetic until God said he had a different plan. But I always thought, you know what? If we ever pastor, we ever lead, one thing I'm not going to have, don't get mad at me, don't get mad at me, don't get mad at me, don't get mad at me. I'm not ever having an Easter egg hunt. You can keep your Easter egg hunts. And if it's going to draw more children, guess what? I believe Jesus can draw children all by himself. He loves children. They love him. But I'm not celebrating reproduction with bunnies and eggs. Because that's what this holiday is all about. That's what Ishtar was, a goddess of fertility. That's why, why do we have eggs and bunnies? So we just blend these holidays together. Passover, Ishtar, call it Easter. No, not doing it, not doing it. You can do it. I'm not going to condemn you for doing it. I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to get behind somebody. You know what they did? I'm not going to talk about you. You can do what you want to do. But don't ask me to participate. Not doing it. Remember one time we were doing our meals, and we had somebody that was really, really, really trying to be a blessing. A blessing. And we were doing our meals, and it was around Passover, and they came and said, I got some decorations for the tables, and they had little Easter eggs that they wanted to put on the table. And I'm like, "Eh, sorry, I can't do that. And that person didn't go to our church, and they, were, they thought, I was just trying to do something nice. I'm, I appreciate you trying to do something nice, but it's kind of going counter to what I teach. It can be confusing to go counter to what I teach. So I think I'm going to steer clear of the uh, Good Friday and stuff until maybe next week. <laughs> maybe. But anyway, I, I, again, I, I'm not trying to be more spiritual than thou and you know, once you see something, if you see something, it's hard to, to just pretend you hadn't seen it. You know, I can't celebrate Halloween. If, if you celebrate Halloween, bless your heart. But I can't, I, I, what I know won't allow me to do it. I can't do it. I can't try to make it something it's not. I can't try to twist it. I just can't do it. You know, right after I got saved, I decided I was going to, I was real involved in everything just like many of you are. I mean, I, I did marches. I did, a, I did a march for life down 1960. We had, we all held hands against abortion, and we were lined up for miles. I mean, miles down 1960. It was awesome, the turnout. It was amazing. Y'all there? Y'all remember that? That's pretty awesome. And then we marched, you know. We didn't march like, in, like a protest. We just marched about life and just loved people. And I met a guy sitting right next to me, and just we just started walking together. We started talking together. Hey, brother, what's your name? Hey, what's your name? And we just started talking. And you know what? Sometimes you need to hear other people's testimony. Sometimes it's good to hear somebody else's testimony. They don't have your testimony. They got their own testimony. It was fun listening to this guy that, how'd you get saved? And then I told him how I got saved. He told me how he got saved. He got saved in a different way than what I got saved. He got saved because he was asked to go to an apartment complex in Houston on Halloween. And then when he got there, found out he was the sacrifice. (laughs) And had to evade people until he could get his brother to come and rescue him from that apartment complex. Because these people he had met that thought were real nice and invited him to a Halloween party had a plan for him. That was not my testimony. But see, once you see a few things about what happens, you have a different perspective. So I can't celebrate it. And I can't twist it to be any kind of trunk or treat or anything you want to put a name on. I just, I don't, I just, I can't do it. 
But I just bless you if you, hey, if a kid comes to my door, I don't open the door and say, that's the devil. <laughs> I give them candy. I say, you're so cute. Look at you. What are you? I just love on them. And let them. I, they're having fun, and they don't know. I'm not going to just like, here's a track. Read this. <laughs> I'm like, dud. Now, you know, here's a Snickers bar is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to I'm gonna give you a good candy. but I'm not going to celebrate it with you. And I'm not going to hide eggs for kids on Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> I'm just lied. I'm sorry. You, you can figure out some kind of sermon where Jesus is in that egg or something all you want. <laughs> but I'm just not doing it. That's right. Our kids have a candy jar on the back counter right there that they just, they pill for every Friday. <laughs> they don't need an egg. If you want to hide something for them, you can you can hide some uh, you can hide some matzo matzo bread or something, you know. Hmm? Did I say matzo? Mat- oh, never mind. No, 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 you, not the uh, the. Um, come on, yeah, the afikoman is a part of the. What? Yeah, I know, I know, but it's part of the. I'm not asking, not asking for the feast. I'm asking for the bread itself. What's it called? It's not called challah bread, baby. I'm sorry, but they don't give you challah bread on, on, on Passover. Matzah, which is what I said when she laughed at me for. It's matzah bread, which is striped, bruised, and pierced. If you look at it, it's the significance of Jesus. It's striped, it's bruised, and it is pierced, just like he was. And they take three pieces and they pull the one out of the middle. They believe it's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And why do we break Isaac? We don't break Isaac. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You break Jesus. Take a piece of that, and they hide it. That's called the afikoman. They put it, in, they wrap it, and they hide it in the house for the kids. That's fun. The kids get to go look for it. Kind of like hunting, but a whole lot better than Easter eggs. And they're looking for that, but they got a different agenda. Because if you find it, the child that finds it gets a present. They get a gift. It is called, what? The promise of the Father. So when they find it, guess what? They tell them, I'll tell you what. 50 days from right now, I'm going to give you a present. That's the promise of the Father. 50 days is Pentecost, when the promise of the Father was sent and the Holy Spirit came on the earth. All of the major things that happen in the scriptures happen on a feast day. It all happened on a feast day. Jesus was our Passover lamb. He was buried on unleavened bread. He took our leaven, he took our sin into the ground with him. He was raised on first fruits. Scripture calls them the first fruits of many brethren, first raised from the dead. In that feast time, and then the promise of the Father, baptism of the Holy Spirit, came on Pentecost. And I believe, even though no one knows the day or the hour, I believe that when the trumpet sounds in the Feast of Trumpets, he'll come back on the feast day. I don't know what year. I'm not going to try to tell you or predict or write a book about it. But I believe he'll use the feast like he's always used the feast, and it's always been an image of who Jesus is. And that's a lot better thing to teach your children than Peter Cottontail hopping down the bunny trail. (laughs) Just saying. There's a lot of truth that can be taught that is history, that is part of their, their inheritance, not a fable. But I tell you what, if you keep teaching your kids about the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus and Tooth Fairy, and then they get older, and you talked about Jesus, and they go, well, I never saw this one. I never saw that one. Never saw. You mean y'all made up all those? It's going to be real hard to say, no, I know you never seen Jesus, but that, he's real. When I came into the kingdom, I came in 
real joyous for a little while, and then I got real mad. Not saying we should. I got mad. I got mad because I was lied to. I, I was mad. I came into the kingdom, and I remember, I remember being this big. I mean, I was little. And I sat in a chair. Well, that's a pew back then. I'm sorry. It was a pew, a wooden pew. And the pastor was out, and he had one of the elders preach that Sunday. I'll never forget it. I was little. I remember that Sunday. I was probably, I don't know, six. I remember that Sunday. I had never heard that man preach ever. I heard him preach one time. He got up in the pulpit and he said this. Miracles have passed away. And they will not return again until Jesus comes back. And I thought, oh, okay. I mean, he has to know what he's talking about. He's a preacher. So I believed. And if someone were to ask me as a child, I'd tell them, no, no, miracles have passed away. And they won't return again until Jesus does. Because someone told me that from the pulpit. No one prayed for the sick. No one expected anybody to be healed. Those were done. I don't know why this happened. I, don't, I can't explain this to anyone with any reasoning. I don't have a reason. All I know is I was a sinner. And on Sunday night, February 26, 1989, between 6 and 6.30 p.m., Jesus came into my heart. And I was no longer an unbeliever. I'm telling you, I got saved, and I believed the Bible. And so I would look at the Bible and be like, no one's even preaching this to me. No one's preaching. I'm reading it, and it says, believers shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. That's in red. And I'm like, that's the Bible. I can lay hands on the sick. and never I started reading stuff, and I was excited and then mad, excited and then mad. I was like, I just want to punch the preacher. <laughs> that sounded like a good game. Don't practice that here. But I really thought I was mad. I'm like, why did they tell me this is gone? Why did they tell me it's not true? This is all in the Bible. Listen, I went. Can I get a little controversial with you? I, Saturday night, I was 100% pro-abortion. Okay? 100%. Sunday night, I was born again. I was pro-abortion because I had even participated because of my girlfriend becoming pregnant. Okay? I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm putting this on me here. To, I'm just being transparent. Life. Okay? Sunday I got saved. No one's preached to me other than, you need Jesus. I know. Say this prayer. Okay. I don't know what happened, but when I said it in a minute, he came in, and I walked in the other room and looked at my mom, and I said, Mom, I just got saved. I, I don't know what. I was born again. I heard the voice of God immediately afterwards. He started talking to me. I'm like, if you would have told me God said, I would have said, you're nuts. You're weird. You're crazy. I'm hearing God. I go to work Monday morning, and I see people. We worked at a place where you had vendors that came in. We saw the same people all the time, every week, right? We're friends, and I'm just working. And this lady walks in that I know that I like, that we just, we're always, hey, how's your day going? We're just, we're just friends. And she starts talking about abortion. I just got saved. I hadn't talked to anybody. And I went, oh, that's murder. That's wrong. I mean, it just came out of my mouth. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I mean, I don't know why I'm saying it. I'm saying it and saying, what? what? My spirit is saying this. And she went, looked at me like I was crazy, like I had three eyes. She was just like, and she scooted away from me. I'm thinking, and I'm thinking, where'd that come from? Nobody told me that's wrong. I wasn't taught it was wrong. It was in me. Life was in me. 
So nobody sat with me and gave me a video. I, I had the Spirit of God in me saying, this is wrong, this is right. I can't explain this, guys, but I'm telling you, sin is real, and it's a, there's a consequence to it. And even if we get redemption, we may still reap some of the fruit of our sin. He doesn't just go, eh, it's all okay. You may still have to suffer some stuff because you messed up. You can pray and say you're sorry, and he'll forgive you and love you, and you may still have a couple consequences. I, I told y'all this. I met Carla Faye Tucker when she was on death row, took one of her last meals to her, star pizza. She wanted star pizza. She got a star pizza. Met her full of Jesus, full of Jesus. You walked in there, and you're just like, oh, oh my gosh, this woman carries the presence of God. Did horrific things. Got the death penalty, and she looked at us and said, I'm good. I'm fine. I did those things. I'm going to pay a penalty for it, and I'm okay with that. I really am. And you could see the peace on her, and she's like, I'm going to see Jesus. He loves me. I love him. I've repented, and I know where I'm going, but I got to pay the price for this. So I've seen it at every extreme, every level. We sometimes have consequences. But there's redemption and there's hope. Constant redemption and hope. And guess what? God's not going to allow you to focus on your consequences. He's not. If you're focusing on your consequences right now, you're listening to the wrong voice. I talked about this a little bit. I'm going to talk about it a little bit for a minute. You know, if you've ever, anybody in this room ever pray for somebody? Raise your hand if you pray for somebody. But please raise your hand high so other people can see your hand. Okay? Look at the hand. Y'all prayed for somebody. How many of you ever prayed for somebody like at an altar, in a church, or at a meeting, and you're like on the prayer team? Raise your hand. Ta-da! Generals. Ta-da! Okay. How many of you ever prophesied to somebody? Raise your hand if you prophesied. Okay. All right. All right. How many of you ever prophesied in front of a group or like a congregation or something? Raise your hand. All right. Guess what? then I know where you've been. I bet you as soon as you prayed for somebody or as soon as you prophesied over, over somebody, you start hearing things right after. That was dumb. That was terrible. They don't know what you, you missed it. Oh my. Every one of you that raised your hand, I guarantee you, at one moment you've had, you've had the voices that come immediately after you prayed, immediately after you prophesied, immediately after you tried to move in the Spirit, and they said, that didn't make any sense. That woman's offended at you. You said something about her womb, her womb. She thinks you're nuts. She's never coming back here again. <laughs> you know why? Because as soon as you finish, the enemy starts talking to you. And as soon as God starts giving you his word and saying, look, there's consequences to your sin. Sin is real. Sin is serious. Let's get rid of this junk. Let's not, deal, let, let, let's not settle with this stuff. Let's get rid of it. Deal with it. Get to the root of this stuff and get free. We're not going to just whitewash over this thing, okay? So he gets serious and he says that to us and then the enemy comes in right behind it. That's right. Remember what you did? Remember what you did? Remember what you did? Consequences, consequences. You're not even saved anymore. You know that? You're going to hell. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. That's the, that's the enemy's voice. That's not God. But he does come in right behind that. Consequences. Con- and God's going, consequences, redemption now. Redemption. Yes, you may have to pay a little bit of price. It may cost you something, but guess what? Redemption. You're mine. Go get the disciples and Peter. Go get the disciples and Sydney. Get the disciples and Kathy. Redemption, because he's good. And his mercy is way beyond anything we can fathom. So what he's wanting us to be is not the people who shout, you have consequences. He wants the people that shout, there's redemption. There's restoration. That's right, that's right. The song we sang, enemy thought he had me, but Jesus said, you are mine. There's redemption. There's freedom. There's not just consequences. There's something way past that. Yeah. These momentary light afflictions are not worthy to be compared with the eternal weight of glory. <laughs> so I had to give part two. 
I had to talk to us about, look, I know there's redemption, and this was a great message to me, what God wanted to release, but he also wants to bring balance and let us know, look, I didn't say, eh, it's okay. I know the word says that, but I'm tell you, the word of God is what needs to be deposited in us so that when Holy Spirit starts to talk, you know it's Holy Spirit saying it. Because even the devil can quote the Bible, and he can appear to us as an angel of light, the Word of God says. Anybody ever see an angel? The hands go up slower, but they do go up. That's right. <laughs> if an angel appears to me, I question. I don't just go, oh, an angel, what saith thou? <laughs> Why are you here? Who sent you? Don't tell me Jesus the Christ is son of the living God. You say that, I'm going to believe you. But if you ain't going to talk about Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God, then maybe it's an antichrist spirit trying to talk to me. I know people that had angels appear to them. They, they try to get them rebuked. Just tell them, go, leave. I ain't talking to you. No, get away from me. I mean, the Lord had to really, really confirm. I'm trying to talk to you because you can read in your Bible also all through the Gospels, the angels appeared. <laughs> they appeared to Joseph. They appeared to John the Baptist's father. And they, talked. they talked. And it made him not talk. <laughs> Consequences. The reason I, I, I wanted to, to go back to this story is this. I'm going to hammer home the most important part of this entire thing every time, and that is redemption. That is restoration and the forgiveness that awaits you. And the mercy of God is way, way beyond what any man can show you. It's amazing, and it's very real. But there's still consequences sometimes, so we don't want to screw up and just make ourselves a target for the enemy. Because when we have secret sin, that is called darkness, and the enemy lives, abides in darkness. Turn the light on. Expose it. Tell it to someone. The enemy hates you telling it to somebody. I've been doing this. Uh, now you're not going to respect me anymore. Maybe they're going to respect you more. Because of your transparency and your humility to admit something. I will only caution you on this level. If you decide you're going to confess something, be sure you go to who the Holy Spirit tells you to confess it to. Because not everybody's mature. Some people be like, ah, I know something about so and so. I don't want to, I don't want to confess to a megaphone out there that's just going to broadcast it everywhere because once people talk, it affects how other people see you. So what happens when you get forgiven and washed and cleansed and, and they still can't see past what they know here? So it's, it's, look, use wisdom. Use wisdom. Find somebody that you know doesn't just open their mouth. Because it, it, it's important to hold confidence for people. It's important. They can trust you then. They can open up some more. But when you betray that confidence, you can, you can hurt people more than just your relationship with them. You know you can hurt their relationship with people in the church. Because if, if they hear it from somebody else in the church and they only told you, then they don't trust anybody in the church. Real important. I got I, I, I got to be a pastor. I got to go go another step. If somebody says something to you that sounds like they know something about you, they might not know nothing about you, but they may be speaking by the Spirit of God prophetically. So don't assume someone has told them your secrets. There's always a balance, guys. Sometimes, look, we live in a prophetic church. If you don't know that, sorry, 
You walked in, you're in a prophetic church. Sometimes people are going to know stuff whether you like it or not. They're just going to know stuff. Sometimes we pray for people and you hold their hand and you go, ooh, that ain't pretty. Every time I say that and we have a prayer line, nobody comes to me. (laughs) Most of the time, the Lord has never, uh, that I remember, I don't think he's ever had me like see something and then confront it. He he never has. Every time he's revealed it, like, boom, I see. Like, I've, I've held hands. Guys come up like, hey, man, I need prayer. What do you need? Whatever Lord leads you, man. All right, let's pray. Grab their hands, boom, pornography. And you're like, ooh. So you know what I pray? Father, I thank you for this holy vessel. I thank you for this pure son of God, filled with your glory. Righteous, holds fast to your word, seeks you for freedom, walks in it. That's what I pray. I don't go, ooh, what you been looking at? The only time God's ever revealed it to me is when he's told me to say who their real identity is. I'm not saying something just opposite. He's like, no, I want you to say their real identity. They don't know who they are. They're doing that because they don't know who they are. They think they're going to find something there. They're not finding anything there except bondage. Tell them who they are. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I won't go any deeper because it gets quiet when you start... uh, I'll start seeing stuff, and then I'll get in trouble. Then I might start seeing stuff by myself, and I don't want to do that either. <laughs> All right, y'all, y'all stand up with me for a second. Oh, if we're, are we still recording? Let's stay there for just a second. On, let's not cut that off for a moment. Y'all stand up with me. Because there may be somebody that's watching or going to watch or whatever. You need to understand the redemption of God. You need to understand... His plan for you is restoration. That's his plan. Restoration, redemption. Restored. That's his plan for you. Don't listen to just the preaching of the devil trying to condemn you, and especially if he's trying to get you to take yourself out. That is a lie. He can't touch you, so he's trying to get you to do it. And we rebuke that spirit in the name of Jesus, that spirit of death in the name of Jesus, that spirit of suicide in the name of Jesus. We bind you. We break your power. We command you to shut your mouth and be silent right now in Jesus' name. We release life over you and peace in the name of Jesus. We release peace. We call you into your identity as a son or a daughter of God so that you can see your destiny in the kingdom, who God has called you to be and what he's going to use you for, to bring freedom to captives, to use your testimony to set others free. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Father, I just thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you for every person that's here tonight, God, because no one's here by accident. And, Lord, whether they hear something tonight that's for them or for someone they're going to encounter later that they need to spread that word to, I pray, Lord, that you bring to remembrance your word in their hearts that they will, they will deliver, they will speak redemption, restoration, compassion. Lord, above everything else, we love your word, but we're looking for your character in the word as well, Lord. What would you say and how would you say it? Because we see the way you lived, and we see a lot of mercy. We see a lot of grace. And the only time we don't really see that mercy is people that thought they were the know-it-alls, the religious leaders, the ones that, that were prideful. So, Lord, don't let us become that. Don't let that apply to us, God. Let us be people that are always teachable, that are always full of compassion, that are always full of mercy. Help us see the people others overlook. Please, Lord, give us eyes to see the ones that others may walk by so nobody's left out. And, Lord, give us a sense of urgency to preach your gospel everywhere we go, in season and out, when it's convenient, when it's not convenient. 
we have the words of life. We have the cure to cancer right in our mouth. Help us release it. Bring life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Look, if you, uh, if you need prayer for anything,